So, good morning, um, friends. Thank you for coming today to the second lecture uh, that's situated here at Wollongong University in EIS, uh, the Faculty of Engineering and Information Sciences, and particularly with a focus on the School of Computing and IT, um, but really relevant to all of you here. Um, my name is Katina Michael, and, and my ho whole intent today is to get you to understand what's available in terms of where to publish, how to find out where to publish, uh, where to target uh, your research, um, how to be wise about your research agenda, and how to really map it out over the next five to ten years. And I know that's a long horizon, but it all does start with um, two things. The first is uh, the fact that you're enrolled in a PhD, uh, which is critical. So congratulations for getting into this wonderful program here at Wollongong University. And the second thing that I think I want to challenge you with is the fact that your PhD has to be a personal journey. And I can't emphasize how important that is that you do your PhD with a purpose. And if you don't have a clear purpose, you have to find what that clear purpose is over the next number of years. And sometimes it's not apparent in the first six months. You know you want to get a higher um, research degree you don't exactly know what you might do with it. Uh, you know that it's the next step in your career path. And so you've invested so much of your energy to come from overseas, some of you, and for others to give up local industry work uh, and, and emphasize and, and give your heart to your doctor of philosophy. Some of you might be in that dual position where you are working presently and trying to complete your PhD. And that's all possible. I tell people anything's possible. It's how badly you want it and how much you love your topic that will keep you up at night to actually keep researching when everyone else is asleep. Usually that's the conundrum. But if you don't have a personal attachment to your research, I need you to find one because that's what's going to get you through and that's what's going to amplify the success of your PhD and your PhD outcomes. What differentiates you is not just your aptitude, it's not just uh, what skills you were gifted with, it's not what you developed through high school and your bachelor's degree, it's actually how badly the effort you want to exert is. And if we're not connected to our topic intrinsically, we're not going to give our full effort or go above and beyond what we would generally do. So if you haven't found that personal connection with your PhD, my first recommendation to you would be to keep your ears and eyes open, connect it with the real world, connect it with practice, connect it with industry, connect it with something that matters to you or your community or your general society. Because if that's not the case, what you're doing is not aimless as such, but will lack oomph. And so my hope today is to transmit to you some of that personal attachment so then you have the impetus to not only share it with your friends, with your family, with people at your university, but to share it globally with society at large. And how do you do that? There are many forms. You could give a talk at university. You could uh, submit an abstract to a conference locally here on campus, like a colloquium for students. You could uh, perhaps over time consider publishing a short article of 900 words with your supervisor. You might consider writing a larger paper, but how do you disseminate knowledge? And how you disseminate it, one of those forms is a written form beyond the oral presentation. As time goes on, uh, we are seeing various impacts of research measured through different mediums. One of those could actually be the media. If your work lends itself to be conveyed beyond simply uh, the written form, then you might actually extend that as part of your mission. But it won't be for all people, and particularly for very technical theses, sometimes that is not the main um, mission, which is to disseminate knowledge to society. It may be to disseminate knowledge to your technical peers. And that's where IEEE comes in. IEEE is an organization that has about 400,000 engineers, as members. The vast majority are male, so I encourage females to join. You have a powerful voice at this table. It is a global organization situated in more than 150 countries. 
with the local chapters, and we have one here. Um, uh, Professor Nikolic is here, Sasha is here, and he has, in the electrical engineering department, uh, particularly in computer science uh, engineering, spurred on the creation. He was our uh, New South Wales chapter chair, if I have that correct, Sasha. Okay. So we then have student bodies that create their own, is it called branches? And they spur on local activities. And I just heard uh, as a preamble before we started this session that we have one of the largest or the largest student body in New South Wales at the moment, right? Get on board for students in particular, the IEEE uh, attempts to keep membership prices very low. And we're just talking, I believe, uh, not even in the tens of dollars for a membership, but depending on how you actually connect with other societies as well. But this, this allows you access and entry to information that you would not generally have through a lecture. It allows you to connect with subject matter and um, special applications like Collaboratech, where you can talk technical matters with your peers, ask questions, answer questions. Um, it's a bit like a Reddit site, but for IEEE, for engineers. Okay. It also gives you access beyond what the library can give you to IEEE Explore. It gives you access to other specialist things, like specific newsletters that may or may not be published in an Explore um, corpus. And it gives you visibility. Who, what are the top guys and girls doing uh, in, in IEEE? What is the groundbreaking new thematic area? How does it connect to my research? And for some of you, the focus will remain within your domain of knowledge. For others, you consider cross-disciplinary or multidisciplinary avenues of disseminating your research. I spoke to uh, three young people yesterday uh, over coffee, and I invite everyone here to have coffee with Katina. Uh, you're welcome. I hold these sessions ad hoc whenever you want to meet uh, while I'm here in Australia. And I like small groups to come and discuss Sometimes it's good if it's within the same discipline to discuss their trajectory and where they're going. And we just start sparring and talking about your research, what's important to you. But uh, I gave an example to a group of computer vision students yesterday at a, at a lunch where I said, how many computer vision people are there in the world? And one individual said, a thousand. And I said, really? Only a thousand? He goes, yeah, just use Google Scholars. And I said, that's a good start, but I would say it's more like a million. They're not all IEEE members. I hope they were. Uh, but then I said, how do you differentiate yourself? How, if you're, if you're one person in a pool of thousands of professionals doing their PhD, how is it that you bustle through to get your research out there? And it's not a competition but rather it's about contribution. But when you take your technical expertise and apply it in a particular area, you may well be one of the few doing that. So I'll give you an example, computer vision and perhaps biodiversity. Two completely different areas, but applying computer vision to biodiversity or machine learning to biodiversity is not where every computer vision specialist is but you carve out a very unique path for yourself and then you become known as the computer vision specialist in biodiversity. Do you need a biodiversity or climate change or science background? It would help. That's why I tell many students, don't rule out a master's degree after your PhD. That's what happened to me. I did my PhD first and then I did a master's degree in national security and I found my tandem specialization but you may well proceed down the technical algorithmic avenue if you're, for example, in computer vision and you are refining algorithms to better a particular approach. Okay? So you either go in detail down the road of the technical specialization or as an industry, you will apply your knowledge to a particular area of expertise. I'll give you an example and we're going to walk through one now. When we type up computer vision in the IEEE recommender system, we get a number of different subtopics, computer vision and robotics, computer vision and medical systems, 
computer vision and blah, 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 blah. You need to know where, where your space is and what your domain is. And the question I asked last week is what's your domain? And that's why I have pieces of paper in front of you. What we're going to do in the next five minutes, and this is quiet time individually, I want you, without thinking too much, it's like a game. You know, if I say to you a word like summer, give me a response to the word summer. Beach. And then I say suntan lotion. You say? Towel. And then I say swimming. And then you say, okay, it's like this. This is how it's got to be with your research. It's got to be on your fingertips. Okay, so the pink piece of paper, I literally want you to write. I'm going to keep a five-minute time limit here. As many words that come to your brain, but don't think about it overly too much. And I'm going to do the same on the board, okay, about my research. But don't look at mine, just write. So five minutes, what encapsulates your research? So thank you for doing that. And what I'm going to suggest is that when you get home and you feel like you can have a cup of coffee or some tea or some water, do the exercise again and give yourself half an hour. And don't do what we did, which was just Snapchat, bang, you know, instant message style response. Think more carefully. Okay? And the reason why I do this is because all through your life, as you go through university, as you go through in industry or you go through... Uh, in academe, you'll be asked for your areas of expertise. Every single institution calls them something different. Sometimes they ask you to bucket yourself within a discipline. Sometimes they ask you to use IEEE keywords, of which there are 5,000 keywords, and you get to choose which ones you are. And if I gave you an example of my work, it's very broad. You think, how could possibly someone cover all of these cross-disciplinary areas? But if I go back and I did this exercise without looking at my keyword list, this is exactly, you know, I haven't mentioned a few of them, uh, but uh, this is how I identified myself at ASU. When I was at Wollongong, it was a separate list of keywords, which I still have on my website. I actually want to ask you what some of your keywords were, and there's no, obviously no right or wrong answer, it's, your, it's what you're thinking, what you're preoccupied with in your mind. So if I start with yourself, could you tell me your name and perhaps your, your responses? Uh, my name is Nani, I am working with the Security Department, and my keyword is BCI. BCI, wow. Um, mm -hmm. Awesome. So keywords there that we heard: brain-to-computer interface, stroke, so rehab. rehab, the robot that you're working with. Uh, you Amadeo. Amadeo. Yeah. What else would you say? Uh, motor, re motor training. Motor training. Yeah. So basically, trying to get someone to recover after um, suffering a stroke, to get different parts of the body perhaps right. stimulated so that they can be have a hope of reusing that limb yeah. back to life. And so brain-to-computer interfaces is your main thing because you're not interested in security as such, perhaps. You're not interested in privacy. You're not interested in consent. You're interested in biomedical um, systems that would help someone rehabilitate after a stroke. So if I was to say to you, Mariam, what's your key word? Would it be BCI? Brain-to-computer interfaces. And we'll use that in a second in an exercise. Another person who wants to volunteer their thoughts. main keyword was facial recognition systems yeah. is a technical domain that you're working in yeah. and you're interested in developing algorithms yeah. for better facial recognition yeah. more improved algorithms with greater accuracy less false positives yeah. uh, and 
uh, false negatives and FRRs and so forth. Um, tell us again, more specifically, the subdomain, so facial recognition systems, algorithms. So where there's more noise and it's not a sort of a predictable environment. Yeah. And the wonderful thing there is, you probably don't know this, probably you do, a biometrics journal has launched. Uh, Kevin Bauer and I were at uh, the panel of editors conference in April and I asked him to submit a paper with his team in the transactions that I'm about to launch in technology and society. So there is a journal of biometrics, and I can't remember if it's a transactions or it's a journal, but the title is biometrics. You know, that's a top avenue as time goes on. Awesome. Fantastic. Okay, we'll, we'll get this. That's awesome work. You guys over there? Okay. And so I guess like the main topic would be knowledge management systems, but when talking about words, I would say systems, people, technology, simplify, secure, improve, seamless, unite. Fantastic. And there are several places you could publish too. Um, there's one on emerging technologies, there's one on human centric computing, there's one on, um, I don't think it's called knowledge management as such, but there's information and management. There, there's outside of IEEE, but there are lots of avenues for you and pretty much it'll be going through some of the papers within the IEEE Explore and go, bang, that's the one I want to go to. So with your domains, there is often a trade-off that you make. I'll give you an example. One of, an early, one of the earliest papers I, I published was something in the Journal of Location-Based Services. It was domain-specific to the point that the title of the journal was called location-based services. It was not IEEE, it was Springer. But I could have done location-based services work or a publication and placed it in an IEEE context, okay? So you often make a trade-off between what you're doing and the name of the journal versus perhaps a higher impact journal, which is maybe a little bit more generic, right? is not branded machine learning, is not branded biometrics, is not branded blah, blah. But I can give you an example within the IEEE space. Uh, one of the journals, a high impact factor journal, which very few do get accepted into, is the proceedings of the IEEE. It's about eight or nine impact factor, if not nine and a half. And I'll tell you what an impact factor is shortly. But you could take your algorithm and publish it in a domain specific journal like the IEEE biometrics journal or transactions of biometrics, or you can say, this one is, is, is generic enough to, be, to, to try and put it in proceedings of the IEEE, or try and put it in IEEE multi-access, okay? But your choice, and we'll talk about the differences between transactions, journals, and magazines next week, but your choice is where do I put it? Because, go ahead, what would you do? Sure does. Universities, which is a capacity, you know, everything from library science to information science to, you know, online portal, all this stuff. I agree with you. And, and so one of the questions I got last week was, well, how do we know where to go? Okay? And we have to be smart about our trajectory with our supervisors discussing this. We have to be smart because it depends where you want to be known. Where is your community? So you've told me where your domain is, but where is your community? I'm not talking about your societal community. I'm talking about your career community, your industry-specific community, your research community. Who are they? Are they made up of algorithmic experts? Are they made up of people who are in their domains but work in the space of technology and society or work in the space of consumer electronics or work in the space of professionals or work in the space. These are all societies within IEEE. And you might make a bit of a hunch of a guess 
where you're most suited to, but as a student, you're allowed to venture, really, you, you guys get the best deals. You could be part of a number of societies and just suss it out. So for BCI, I mean, there's a medicine and biology society. I'm part of that and have been for some time. Very technical outlet. Even their magazine is technical. But if you want to study BCI, there you go. Uh, there was also a conference I just attended, the BHI and BSN conference in Chicago. Uh, I think it was the 30th of April. Yeah, something like that. It's a blur now. But BHI, BSN, like the sensor networks uh, and the specific sort of body focus was another place where I heard about stroke rehabs and recovery. And I thought, you know, some of my students back at ASU would love to have come to that conference. But I wasn't so sure before I went there what it, that community was all about. But it's a sub-community of the Medical and Biology Society. So, who, so, so in your case, I forgot your name? Deb. Deb. So Deb, if... Tim. T Tim, sorry. If Tim, my community was MIS quarterly guys, situated wholly within the IS community, Am I thinking that I may in the future be employed by a business faculty or am I thinking I'm on the technical uh, sort of engineering side of knowledge management? Am I on the business side or am I on the technical engineering side? Both are technical. I don't demean one or the other. Both have their technical capacity and I would be the first to be corrected if I said otherwise. So when people say to you, oh, you're very technical or you're technical, at the same time, all of it's technical. You know, I'd like to use the term socio-technical, which is why technology and society, the society on the social implications of technology drew me, because I was neither ultra-technical and neither was I completely a sociologist or social scientist. I was sitting somewhere in between these two domains, which is why all of these areas appeal to me. And when I did my master's in the law faculty in the area of national security, why I branched out even more right? So predictive analytics, all of that became very important to me. Policing, criminality, um, hot pursuit, tracking, covert surveillance, all of this became a huge area of my, my expertise and my, my interest. So tie yourself, and IEEE, I'm here not to talk on behalf of the IEEE, I just think that's where the majority of our EIS students will be publishing, but it's to expose you, and I will in a moment, expose you beyond IEEE, there's Elsevier, there's Springer, there's Sage, there's so many different public publishing houses. But depending on what you do, you will oscillate towards one or more. Okay? So traditionally, EIS students publish in IEEE, Elsevier, Springer. They're the main three. Whereas if you're in social science, you'll go Taylor and Francis Routledge, you might go Sage, you might go, but you don't know yet. But I want you to start learning, even if it's drilling through, what are the societies within IEEE? Which one do I have the closest affinity to? Which one might help me in my trajectory of my research and boost my outcomes and, and become known in that community? Uh, if I was to say to you that every IEEE member, full member, knows who Sasha is, it's because they do. <laughs> He's the IEEE chapter New South Wales section chair. Sorry if I'm saying that all the opposite. But Automatically, what does that do? That, that gives Sasha the ability to disseminate his knowledge, but also to bring people on board and to look at opportunities for collaboration. And now, he's not the section chair in order to promote himself. He's actually promoting everyone else around him. But by doing that, he's also continuously being pinged, this is what's important, this is what's relevant, this is what we need, this is what we don't have, this is what we need a specialist for. And that knowledge that professional service or community service in your area gives you so much back to your research trajectory. I can't tell you how much. If I had never become part of the society I did, I don't believe I would even be a professor today. Because, I don't know, I, I, I would not have known what's out there. You know, every day we're calling for volunteers and there aren't enough people to volunteer. But by volunteering your time in a domain, you are already learning in the process of, of sharing your, and disseminating your research or at least bringing others together. So the last person, um, I might get you to introduce yourself and tell me about your topic.
Yes. Which is a criminal for others. The sum or the value to show you where the guy took the money from. So you only need two shots uh, to pull money to buy the thing. Excellent. And are you in the School of Mechanical Engineering? Yes. Yeah. Yourself as well, Mary? Uh, no. You're not? In You're in SECTI. Awesome. So you can even see it would be slightly different um, in your own domains, right? You'd be focusing on a different aspect of the bigger picture, right? And whereas, Mariam, your work might be publishable in one domain, your work, Alexandra, may be the same area, but a different layer of the stack, as we call it, right? Um, and, and if I was to say what that stack is, um, we could work from the users to the services they may, and applications they may require, to the physical infrastructure required to enable those services, right down to the physical interfaces. Like, just think of the OSI stack. Mm -hmm. And you are sitting somewhere in that stack. And the more we go towards materials and mechatronics, the lower down the stack we're going. In my case, I'm sitting right at the highest s level of the stack because I'm no longer dabbling in the algorithms. I'm dabbling in the implications of the algorithms, whereas you're building the algorithms. You're looking at a number of layers, uh, Miriam, in your work. And Tim, you're probably more towards services infrastructure layer, right? Rather than the actual, how do I build the computing component that actually creates the ability to do knowledge sharing, right, and dissemination. Uh, whereas your, do, do you see what I mean with that internet stack? So you always have to be knowledgeable about where you sit in the stack, but also why your research is important to the person down or up the stack. You can't disassociate yourself from the world. Some people say, I'll give you a, an example. I, I, I was at a conference about two years ago. It was an RFID specialist conference. And someone was talking about deep brain stimulation, okay? The ability to put pacemakers or sensors or electrodes in the brain to stimulate neurons back to life. And something was a bit strange. You know, this person was considered one of the highest authorities in the development of brain-to-computer interfaces. And I, I had to put up my hand at one point, and I said, you do understand that some of these people are awake. In fact, the vast majority are awake when the electrodes are placed in the brain. And there was a big hush in this room full of professional researchers. And the person says, no, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, you, it can't be possible. Like, what? You've never actually seen an operation of a brain-to-computer interface, uh, 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 brain, deep brain stimulation electrodes being placed in the brain. Just Google it. Watch a YouTube clip. But they were so distant from the application that they were looking at how to develop the actual system that goes in, that they had no idea what the brain surgeon was doing, which I can't really understand within my heart. So you have a premier engineer who has no knowledge of the actual delivery of the system he's building because it's a small component of a bigger system, right? Very, and, and, and I've learned from this process that that's perhaps, it, perhaps it doesn't matter because you're only looking at this part of the bigger system, right? You just want that chip to work in a certain way or you want that electrode to work in a certain way or you want something like the cable you're, maybe only you're worried about the cable that's going from the heart battery, the battery pack in the heart area or in the, in the clavicles up the, the neck and into the brain, right? If it's vagus nerve stimulation, okay? Maybe it doesn't matter, but you have to be aware of what this all means because if you are doing this in the blind, I worry about, as engineers, you don't have the understanding or as IT people, you don't have the understanding of the deployment. So in your case, Miriam, obviously you're not working on a real person every time you're doing the, 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 the stroke rehab testing, but you're working through a robot to simulate that, I gather, on people, on real patients, which is pretty awesome. But you can't get it better than that. True? That's remarkable and that's fantastic. Because you're going to know. I mean, there, there was a, another case I was talking at the Academy of Science where someone was talking about the length of a lead to a device that was external to the human body. But no one had thought about the fact that this person would have to go to the toilet. Right? It's, it's a simple 
problem, but if you're not working with human subjects and you haven't gone through that ethics approval, you're disassociated, you know? And in your case, it may be the algorithms, right? You have to do a lot of simulation to perfect that, but wouldn't it be great to see your solution implemented in a real world context, especially with the noise factor? And you will try to simulate that with an environment you create, right? So what I'm trying to say is get as close to the proximate problem as possible because it gives you eyes that other people don't have, right? So importantly now, I was going to ask you to do a mind map, and I think I'm going to. We have time. So on the white piece of paper, what I want you to use is the keywords you created on the pink sheet, and I want you to draw pictures that connect your concepts together. Any way you want to graphically represent what you do because this is actually more important than the recommender systems I'm going to show you. If you can't articulate what you're doing, you'll have a trouble using the rec recommender system, right? So just draw diagrams. <clears throat> I encourage you to do that exercise at home as well. I will give you four pieces of A3 paper that I want you to take home and redo it and stick it on your wall. In fact, what you've just planned out may well be the next five to ten years of your research effort, whether it be in government, in industry, in non-government organisations, in hospitals, in um, academe. If someone says to you, show me what you're about, you literally stick this picture up and you've got to know what you're about. Again, Alexandra, before you walked in, I talked about a personal connection and journey to your PhD that he has to have a purpose, that he has to matter, and he has to keep you up at, at night because that's the best PhDs come out of that, no matter what your aptitude or gifts are. And if you haven't found that, keep seeking it, keep looking for it, keep, keep looking for that motivational factor. I think, uh, Miriam, when you are working with real people, that is your motivation, trying to get people who are sick rehabilitated through the use of technology. Um, one of the things uh, I've done recently is to look at motor neuron disease because we have a professor here suffering from motor neuron disease, uh, a wonderful man, Justin Newbery, and my thought has been, well, how can technology help? And disability innovation is a burgeoning area at the moment, I can't tell you. Every university I go to, they're all talking assistive tech or disability innovation or some cross-sectional um, application of technology in the area of disability, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So just for your safety and awareness, you know that my, all my notes are made available to you free and you can refer to them, download them, whatever you want. You can email me if you actually want the PowerPoint package, but everything is here. Um, and that's just my personal website, katinamichael.com, and the address there is editor. And if you leave your email, I will make sure to send you this detail um, after the class, I promise. So let's do a test. And I'm going to use Miriam's example. And here I've gone to the publication recommender system of IEEE. It's a free service. It's publicly available. And it was created because people used to ask the question, well, which of the 200 periodicals do I submit to and which of the 1,800 conferences do I attend? Okay, it's exactly the, what, the reason and the question we're asking in this class. And Miriam, I think you said brain-to-computer interfaces. Let's have a go and write that in. Here we go. So I haven't done anything yet, and it already sort of anticipates where am I? Am I in BCI? Am I in brain modeling? It's, it's anticipating what I might type, perhaps based on previous users. So let me go back and put a hyphen there. Okay, so the more I write, the more it's coming up with some of these, and you might say, that's me. You might say, Miriam, that's me. And it doesn't really matter because any of these words potentially will give you back a similar. And what I want you to do is initially just put in brain-to-computer interfaces and then start playing with it to more specific terminology like stroke rehabilitation. Okay, so let's put brain-to-computer interfaces and click on this. And I want both periodicals and conferences, but if I just want a periodical because I need one journal paper, because my supervisor is encouraging me 
to publish in a journal, let's just go periodicals. Periodicals means journals, transactions or magazines, not conferences. So that's, uh, if I'm working on this and I'm searching from the 190, and if you have a publication date in mind, for example, you know that your thesis is due in like 12 months and you've got to have an outcome by June or I shouldn't say June now, but let's say uh, September because you're submitting in December, this is how you'd go about it. Some journals publish their turnaround times and IEEE tries their hardest to interact and give you a response within three months. But as my own experience has been, it will be no more than six months and sometimes it will be two weeks. Okay? Some of the better, higher impact journals will give you a response faster. It may not be a response you want to see, but they will give you a response, right? And they'll give you an avenue for how you might develop. And if they don't, I will teach you mechanisms over the course of the next six weeks of how to approach an editor to ask for more feedback on how you might rectify something, okay? If it was an unsubmit, and I talked about unsubmits last week, where they basically the administrator of the journal publication sees it and will reject it on one of four things. The template was not used. The referencing style was not used. It's out of scope for that particular um, journal or the English is not good. So they will only put it through review if all of these four things are actually met as a basic fundamental outcome of your publications. And I had some notes in the previous uh, lecture which you can go and scroll down on, on my webpage, but I'm hoping also to put the audio up in case you want to hear it. So let's get the recommendation. Hopefully something will come back. So I acknowledge that the use of this tool does not result in article submission or um, publication, does not guarantee publication. But let's look at this. So, Miriam, we have Neural Systems and Rehab Engineering. It's a transactions journal. We have the Computational Intelligence magazine. And we'll talk about the differences of transactions journals and magazines next week. We've got Cognitive and Developmental IEEE Transactions and we have the Transactions on Biomedical Engineering. With discussion with your supervisor, okay, you will know, you, you can present to him or her a list of these items and then say, you know, this is what I would like to do. Um, and the impact factor here tells you how many times that particular paper or a paper in that particular publication outlet has a propensity to be cited. So on average, the articles in this journal or transactions get published, get cited about four times in their lifetime. Some could be much higher. For example, if you write a groundbreaking article, a new contribution, you've, you're probably sitting on one <laughs> with your algorithm, but the faster it gets disseminated through IEEE, the faster someone might cite you and then your citation index grows. Okay? The higher the impact factor journal, the greater the propensity of you to be cited. But on the flip side, it's also the harder to get in because the acceptance rate is lower. Okay? Let's say this again. The higher the impact factor, the better. And in computer science and engineering, the impact factors usually oscillate somewhere between one and four, especially in the medical domain, Miriam and Alexandra. You're, you're in a very good space where, very good space, Everything is a good space, but the propensity of your work to be cited higher just by looking at the impact factor of your journals, because there aren't that many in the domain, okay, you will be cited more often if you get a paper in one of these high impact factor journals. In the other case, for Tim, knowledge management, you hit one of the um, six top IS journals, the impact factor is as solid as the medical systems domain. But the lesser known or lesser cited journals, okay, may not have an impact factor over one. Because I believed in my work and I believed so much in it that I think this is the reason why we have a transactions in technology and society, right, in a technical domain, in the engineering world, where we've gotten people to start thinking about the, 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 the associations, right? that our technical work has social implications. In your case, you have a good body of existing outlets to publish in where you are already recognized, okay? Um, this has a wonderful name, 
Systems Man Cybernetics magazine. It's not yet available. There's an A, B, and C, okay, to this one. Um, the reason why the impact factor is not there is it takes five years for a new outlet, okay, to develop Systems an impact Man factor. and Cybernetics mag um, well, it used to be a journal. A, it used to be a journal, right? So they broke it down into three, and so they started from scratch to get an impact factor again. But that's been around for a long time, but its impact factor is not yet available, like the transactions in technology and society I will be leading, because you can only get an impact factor after five years. You're externally assessed by Clarivite and another company called Thomson Reuters. Okay? So you just can't get an impact factor overnight. They look at quality of reviews, depth of submissions, quality of the author submitting, quality of the editorial board. Quali you have to look at these quality factors. Do you know anyone on that board? Are they recognized in your domain? Or are they just, who knows? Okay? But usually there's a synonymous nature between the impact factor, the editorial board strength, the, the number of submissions, the type of submissions, and so forth. Okay. So then what I would do, Miriam, I would drill down. And maybe we go to this one, because you mentioned rehab. There you go. Submission to publication. So if you submit something, it's reviewed and it's accepted. It will happen on an average within 26 weeks. And how do we know this? Because IEEE track everything when you have submitted through Manuscript Central. And we'll go on the back end in a few weeks where I show you the actual process of submission. And I said to the last week's students, make sure you have an ORC ID straight away already because you have one degree, right? You can list something against the ORC ID. And if you don't know what that is, go back to last week's notes. But you go to orcid.org and you get a unique researcher ID that the world knows you by. So when you publish, that ORC ID already registers against that publication and that submission. In addition, when you do reviews as students or as lecturers in the future, every re review that you do through the ORC ID actually is registered on, a, on an application now called Publons, P-U-B-L-O-N-S. The more reviews you do, the higher your reputation on Publons, but it's all linked through the ORC ID. So you now start to get credit, not just for submitting, but also for reviewing. But let me tell you, reviewing is not a task that many universities actually take seriously or at least acknowledge in workloads. So if you tell your supervisor at the end of the year, I didn't publish anything, but I did 10 reviews, they'll look at you and say, that's very good. Right? And it really is good, but think. right? So when you're younger, you spend more time on the side of the writing, your own work, but I would also say the flip side of reviewing, and we touched that on the last, in the last week, the flip side of reviewing is that you get to see the level of other people's submissions. And, you get, and the more you review, the more you learn, ah, that's a nice paper. I wish I could write like that. I still think that, and I'm an editor-in-chief. I think about that all the time. You know, I wish I could write so eloquently. I wish I could describe my objective so clearly. I wish I could have a method that was executed so well. I wish I had results in that paper. I wish I could discuss the results so eloquently. I wish there was a clear contribution to knowledge in the conclusion. Okay, you learn what a squeaky clean paper is. And now after, if I would say a thousand reviews, I could look at something like that and go, oh, this paper's going to be good. You smell a good paper. Look at when you're doing a literature review. You find the paper and you think, oh, I wish my PhD was like this, right? That's how you learn. Last week I talked about the process. You go through the good papers. You take, I still have, I told the class last week, I have the manila folder where in the first six months I went physically to the library and back then there was no really online databases, not many anyway. I grabbed the six journals that smelt the best I looked at the back for the submission details. I photocopied the submission details because back then it used to be on the back page and there was no electronic template and you would mail on a, on a CD or a floppy disk the paper, right? Now you go bang, it's up there on Manuscript Central, right? It takes you like an hour to go through the submission process and it's up and it's being reviewed, right? Back then it was slower. So you better have been sure about where you're going to send to because you did not want to waste mail to the states. You didn't want to do this and that and you know, follow the referencing, which is always convoluted in each journal. There was no EndNote really properly until a bit later. Um, I think 1.0 came out in 2002, 2001 of EndNote. 
your late text. Bib text was not in, in existence uh, as much. But what I'm trying to say to you is those papers that I chose, I still have in my office. I still aspire to publish in some of those journals I haven't published. I have a bucket list that I want to, before I retire, to get into. Right? But I go through rejections too. And I'm ready for them. And I bet I can tell you that I know the paper's going to be rejected almost even as I'm submitting. And why? Either it's incomplete, it's half-baked, I haven't done all the proper things that a normal, good, structured paper does. There may not be clear, key findings, but I'm trying. And sometimes you've got to make a decision. If it's 90% done, do I throw it in there? Or in this higher impact factor, does it need to smell from head to toe clearly? No grammatical mistakes. No referencing issues. Your template is squeaky clean and you followed it and it's in the scope. And they go, whoa, this is a good paper. I'm going to send it out for review. And you've given them from the outset less chance to reject you because it smells like a great paper. And then they're more concerned about the technical contribution. In some of your cases and in, in yours it may be presenting existing knowledge in new ways. It could be theoretical, Tim, it could be methodological, any number of areas. Yes? Well, well one question then. So say if you're aiming for a software journal and you get rejected three times in a row and then you have done three different papers and then you're trying to get a fourth one in, does that have any effect on the process? Or no. Absolutely not. Okay. And do they like seeing your improvement? Yes. <laughs> I'll give you a story of a guy in Secti who... Uh, I won't name. Uh, I was with him on a, on a business trip uh, to one of the Chinese universities. He said, I thrive on rejections. And I said, what do you do? He said, I turn them into publishable papers. I said, where do you send them? To the same place. Okay. But if you get detailed reviews, it's like a, doing a grant in a university. If you get a detailed grant response, a review, it means someone's interested. And I never gave up. So, so think about it like a game. And think about it as a learning experience. So how will you improve based on comments of the reviewers? If a grant gets a deep held rejoinder, what happens? You know, the first time I put in a, an ARC grant, I got very nice remarks, but I didn't get the grant. And I showed my dean at the time, who was Professor Joe Chicharo, who's now the um, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Teaching and Learning. He was my dean. And he said, Katina, cop out. They should have given you the grant based on these recommendations. He was a college of expert at the time in a different domain. I was doing telecommunications policy work. What did I do the following year? Come February, I resubmitted almost 90% the same grant. I changed my budget. The budget was the problem. I got the grant. 200,000 bucks. And you may meet one of the recipients of that grant, a scholarship student who's now a uh, lecturer in the business faculty. I she's running a bit late. But that's the outcome, right? That's the joy of don't give up. And this guy I'm talking to you about in SECTI, every time he got a rejection from an A-star, what we call an A-star, a high impact factor journal, he would resubmit. And he would do everything the reviewer said. He had no chance to think in his mind he would be published. He was published. Seven A and A star papers in like two years. That's like phenomenal. How can you not promote someone like that? And again, remember the word brute force. Some of you will be gifted with all the smarts that I don't have and you'll get in the first time and I'm going to be your biggest fan going, that is wonderful. But for the greater majority, it's trying again. It's not giving up. It's understanding that this is a small moment in your research trajectory and journey. Um, so you, you get to know other things, you know, how many issues per year, that tells you, Miriam, whether it's, okay, you know, 12 times a year is pretty frequent, whereas my transactions will only be quarterly, okay, and page counts now matter to societies because they're paying for the creation of the publication, okay, but if there are 12 issues per year, you have a bigger chance to get in. If they publish 300 papers per year, you've got more of a chance, perhaps, depending on the acceptance rate. Whereas in my case, I'm only publishing 16 articles of X pages a year. You see? 
and some of these journal outlets and transactions are much bigger. Okay, which means you're probably competing with more people because the acceptance rate may be the same, but you're just comp your competition is different. But I would, because of the faculty's insistence almost today, there was a meeting last week where they said only publish in high quality outlets, which is very difficult for students to achieve. Right? It's a lot of pressure on you already. How are you going to hit the four and nine impact factor journals? And I would say to you, one of the strategies a mentor of mine in 2006 said to me from the business school, he said, always go for the top first, then work backwards. Right? Because also the top journals will give you the most reviews or the deeper reviews. Sometimes my reviews have been almost as long as my papers. <laughs> right? But that's an audience that does what? They want you to succeed. Okay? So it's, you get more, more, fa more coming back, you've got them. And they know who you are. Okay? But it's about creating a community of practice around you. So I'm not going to play with this anymore, apart from, let's just put one term in there for Tim. Knowledge, if I can spell. Which one is that? <laughs> Which one? No, top one, okay. Ha. Huh. Now, in your case, you would follow through and perhaps go to this first one. Good impact factor. 40 weeks instead of 26 weeks, the publication date. No. The worst ones are up to two years. But it depends if you're, as an average, right? So if your paper goes through two major revisions, that's not a lot. Right? But you usually got, after you've submitted and you get a review, if they say major or minor revision, you've got between 30 and 90 days to actually resubmit the updated. And that's not a long time when you've got everything else going on in your life. Yeah. Right? Yes. Both. So open access available um, often means if you want open, it's like hybrid, if you want open access there is a cost associated with that. And the cost usually is about 1750 US dollars. And over time I will start to talk to you about how everything is going to become free open access, but not quite yet. Nothing. Same review process. Yeah. Except open access, the minute you sign the copyright form, it goes into Explore and anyone can download it. So let's go over that again. Open access, if there is a model of payment that IEEE have, you don't pay to get your paper online. It doesn't work like that. You have to go through the review process. And if your funding agency supporting your supervisor or supporting you will pay money to open your work up, it then doesn't sit behind a paywall. You don't have to have the IEEE Explore password. You don't have to go through URW library. If you Google it, it will go straight to the open access and bang, it's open for everyone. And the argument has been in the past, if it's open to everyone, you're more likely to be cited. Right? But over time, the Europeans are going to demand open access. And that's called Plan S. Educate yourself on what Plan S is. It means that if you create your website or you go to research online at URW and you publish a paper, you need to prove to your funding agency that it's open, that in some shape or form you can publish. And if you go to my website, I haven't uploaded any PDFs, but if you go to my research page, literally, absolutely every single article I have written and has been published is here in plain text. I'll give you an example. This is not my IEEE PDF article. It's my word.